Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Lisa Newman, the Contact Principal Investigator for the Recover Observational Cohort Studies at the Administrative Coordinating Center and the moderator of today's session. Welcome to the Recover Research Reviewer R3 Seminar. The goal of this series is to catalyze the formation of a scientific stakeholder community within and beyond the Recover Consortium and foster a shared understanding of the state of the science and to provide an enduring educational resource for recover investigators, the broader scientific community, clinicians, patients, and other public stakeholders. I want to thank, thank, start by thanking everyone for attending and to those who submitted questions in advance. Please submit any questions that arise today using the Q&A feature in Zoom. After the presentation, we will answer as many questions as possible about today's presentations. Some questions may also be answered within the Q&A during the webinar. We will not answer questions about individual clinical care. Today, we will present on the mechanistic pathways of post-acute sequelae of COVID, session one. The purpose of this session is to provide a high-level overview of the mechanistic pathways, including viral persistence and viral reservoirs, residual tissue and organ damage and injury, immune response, inflammation and autoimmunity and reactivation of other viruses, and secondary damage and reprogramming of host tissues and organs. Subsequent seminar sessions will do a deep dive on these different pathways. We have an impressive speaker panel today. Our presenters are Dr. Akiko Iwasaki, Dr. Jim Stone, and Dr. Amy Proal. Dr. Mara lahovich scroggins the moderator, will synthesize the information pre presented by these panelists and guide initial discussions with them. So let me start by introducing our panelists. Dr. Iwasaki is a professor of immunobiology and molecular, cellular, and developmental biology at Yale University and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Her research focuses on the mechanisms of immune defense against viruses at the mucosal surfaces and the development of mucosal vaccine strategies. She is the co-lead investigator of the Yale COVID-19 recovery study, which aims to determine the changes in the immune response of people with long COVID after vaccination, and is the director of the new Yale Center for Infection and Immunity. Dr. Iwasaki is at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic with respect to research, science communication, and public service. She is quoted in numerous media outlets with expert insights and is considered one of the top 50 top 10 expert, top 50 experts to trust during the pandemic. She is also well known for advocacy on women and underrepresented minorities in the science and medicine fields and has a large follower base in social media. Dr. Iwasaki will present the immunology of long COVID today. Our next presenter will be Dr. Jim Stone. Dr. Stone is director of the autopsy service and head of the cardiovascular pathology service at Massachusetts General Hospital and associate professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School. He is a site principal investigator for the Recover Autopsy Cohort and member of the Recover Steering Committee. He is the past president of the Society for Cardiovascular Pathology. He has published multiple papers regarding the pathology of COVID-19, including an international multicenter study describing the spectrum of cardiac changes associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. Dr. Stone will discuss the pathology of SARS-CoV-2 infection and implications for the biologic mechanisms underlying post-acute sequelae of COVID. Finally, Dr. Amy Proal is a microbiologist who serves as president of PolyBio Research Foundation and directs the organization's Long COVID Research Consortium. Her work examines the molecular mechanisms by which viral, bacterial, and fungal pathogens dysregulate human gene expression, immunity, and metabolism. In her work with PolyBio Research and the Long COVID Research Consortium, she conceptualizes and coordinates large-scale collaborative research projects among research teams studying infection-associated chronic illnesses, such as post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 or PASC, ME, CFS, and long line. 
She has written multiple review articles that delineate core biological drivers of both the PASCs and MECSF disease processes. Dr. Proal will present an overview of SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in long COVID or PASC. Our discussant today is Dr. Mara Lahovic Scroggins. Dr. Scroggins is program director at the National Institutes of Health at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, Division of Lung Diseases in the Airway Biology and Disease Branch. Her portfolio areas of focus are respiratory medicine, pulmonary pathophysiology, and immunology with a concentration in diseases such as cystic fibrosis, disorders of mucociliary clearance, including ciliopathies and other rare lung diseases. Her current portfolio also includes respiratory tract infections and susceptibility, mucins and mucus biology, mucosal immunology, epithelial cell biology, gene delivery and editing technologies, and women's health. Before joining NHLBI in 2018, she was the assistant research professor at University of California, San Francisco in the, assist, in the Airway Clinical Research Center. She is the current chair of the NIH Recover Pathobiology Working Groups and scientific program lead of the Recover Pathobiology Research Portfolio. Dr. Lahovich Scroggins, as I mentioned, will serve as the seminar discussant. Following the presentation, she will conclude by synthesizing them and asking a few questions to initiate the discussion. Then we will open it up to questions from the audience. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible related to today's presentations. I Please welcome me in welcoming all of our speakers. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Iwasaki. Thank you very much um, for the kind introduction. I'm very uh, excited to be here today. So in my talk, I'm going to give a sort of broad overview of what we understand about the immunology of long COVID, and then to give you um, some of the uh, recent uh, insights that we're gaining from our own studies and sort of conclude with uh, 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 some of the uh, key questions that need to be addressed in this field. So before I begin, I want to emphasize that long COVID is not the only post-acute infection syndrome that happens after a, a so-called acute infection with viruses and bacteria and parasites, uh, which have been long known to cause these type of sequela. Um, SARS-CoV-2 is the newest member to join this list of uh, post-acute infection syndromes, uh, and we really do need to understand the underlying mechanisms of these diseases, and there may be something that's shared, uh, the, the ultimate sort of disease um, phenotypes and symptoms converge to um, so something very similar between each other, and so uh, whether some of the pathogenesis that we can think about for long COVID May, may have a shared uh, biological uh, sort of processy with other um, pathogens is something that we should keep in mind. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a potential hypothesis. This is uh, not at all a comprehensive list of different hypotheses, but some major ones that are kind of coming out. Uh, one is that there is viral reservoir that is established within a person with long COVID and persistent viral reservoir or um, viral pathogen accessory molecular patterns such as the RNA itself or the antigen itself can trigger a chronic inflammation of both innate and adaptive immune system. And that can trigger some of these uh, sequela of um, acute COVID. Uh, there are numerous papers that are coming out. I, I listed just a few of them here but there's definitely evidence of viral antigens and RNA found in various tissues months post-infection, and you'll hear a lot more about this from uh, Jim and Amy later. We also um, think that some of the long COVID uh, pathogenesis could be driven by autoimmunity. Uh, this can be mediated either by autoreactive T cells or B cells that secrete antibodies against self-antigens, um, and a very nice paper by Jim Heath's group that was published in Cell last year identified the uh, early presence of lupus-related autoantibody as one of the four predictive factors for developing long COVID. Um, there are a couple of other studies, including our own, which I will describe in more detail, that demonstrated that at least 
autoantibody against type 1 interferon, for example, or other antigens, um, extracellular antigens, are, are not found to be significantly elevated, but there may be other types of drivers uh, that are related to T cells. There's also um, dysbiosis of microbiome and uh, potentially latent virus reactivation that could be contributing to long COVID. And these are, again, some of the papers that demonstrated that ABV reactivation uh, may be happening in long COVID patients. And the uh, Jim Heath's paper demonstrated EBV viremia at the time of acute COVID is the other um, one of the four predictive factors for developing long COVID. And tissue damage, which you will hear more from uh, Jim's talk, I'm sure, uh, is something that can occur during uh, long COVID, uh, potentially uh, after a severe acute COVID phase. But we've also seen in an animal model uh, with Dr. Michelle Monge's laboratory that even a mild respiratory restricted COVID infection in mice can result in chronic changes in the brain that uh, is seen after seven weeks post-infection. Uh, and this study is, is interesting. They used uh, dogs that are trained to sniff out uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected cell supernatant. Uh, and these dogs were able to identify about 50% of the long haulers, whereas 0% of the control groups were identified, uh, providing a, a pretty unbiased um, sort of analysis of a potential viral antigens or uh, viral antigen uh, driven um, organic compounds that are released into the um, uh, by the uh, long COVID patients. So there, there are all these hypotheses and uh, long COVID is not one disease. It probably is a combination of these types of uh, pathologies that occur. Um, some long haulers may be suffering from one of these while others may have a combination. We also have to think about the temporal relationship of uh, each one of these things driving each other. So it's a very complex um, picture, but we're actually intense research has now identified uh, very key insights into these hypotheses. So today I'd like to talk about our, our own research that we're doing with uh, Dr. David Petrino's group at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, uh, where he is treating thousands of patients with long COVID. And we started collaboration uh, as soon as long COVID became uh, known. And um, his group uh, consists of uh, Jamie Wood, Laura Tabakoff, and Dana McCarthy. Um, together, we've been working over uh, two and a half years on this disease uh, to try to understand the immune phenotypes. And these are the co-first authors that contributed to that study. Uh, it's currently uh, posted on Med Archive if anyone is interested. So the way in which we approach this is to um, uh, recruit participants that have long COVID, uh, which are the uh, purple people here, um, and then the convalescent controls. These are people who acquired COVID around the same time, but have fully recovered from COVID. And the healthy control, these are the people who hadn't been infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And we also had healthcare workers that provided uh, their serum for antibody analyses. Uh, from the biospecimen collected from these patients, which are our uh, peripheral blood cells, we did a flow cytometry to look at the cell types in the blood, as well as their activation status. We also looked at antibodies against a uh, human exoproteum, which are transmembrane and secreted proteins. We also did SARS-CoV-2 antibody profiling against the viral antigens. We also did peptide display library with serimmune, which detects um, antibody reactivity against linear epitopes uh, found in virtually um, any pathogens or uh, humans, and plasma proteomics to look at the cytokines and hormones. And we also did a lot of the symptom survey and EMR, uh, which I'm not going to have time to talk about today. So the long COVID participants in purple uh, compared to the convalescent control uh, were fairly well matched with respect to age, sex, and acute COVID severity. And I want to emphasize that we try to focus on non-hospitalized patients who then went on to develop long COVID. And as with many other studies, uh, this is a female dominated disease, as you can see. Um, and then days from acute COVID was uh, around 400 days plus or minus, 
meaning that this is um, well over a year after the initial infection phase. So we're looking at a pretty late phase of long COVID. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna give you some highlights of what we discovered so far. Um, so for instance, when we looked at different types of cell subsets using the flow cytometry, uh, and then the healthy control, sorry, the healthy control is orange, the convalescent control is yellow, and long COVID uh, patients are in purple. What we found was that there is an elevation of uh, non-conventional monocytes, both uh, percentage-wise and activated phenotypes, as well as reduction in the conventional dendritic cell type one. Uh, these are the cells that are known to be important for inducing T cell immunity against intracellular pathogens. We also see elevated levels of activated B cells and double negative B cells in the long COVID participants. Uh, with respect to T cells, we saw that there is a reduction in the CD4 T cell central memory T cell um, type in the long COVID patients and uh, elevation in the exhausted T cell subsets, both CD4 and CD8 T cells. So this suggested to us that there may be something uh, chronic or persistent that the T cells are recognizing um, in the long COVID participants. And we are trying to now understand what these T cells might be reactive to. We also uh, looked at intercellular cytokines that are produced by these uh, CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells and found that the long COVID patients had elevated levels of IL-2 IL-4 and IL-6. And when we focused on the IL-4, IL-6 double positive CD4 T cells, we saw that they were pretty much only found in the long COVID participants. And I'll come back to these cell types in a little bit um, because there's an interesting correlation between these cells and um, EBV. Uh, we also uh, looked at antibody uh, response against the nucleocapsid and the spike protein uh, either the total spike, the S1, and the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. And we controlled for the number of vaccines that the recipients uh, received, which is um, two doses. Um, and it looked at their ability to bind to these uh, antigens. And what we found was that the long COVID participants had elevated levels of the anti-spike, anti-S1, and anti-RBD antibodies. And this uh, we don't know how that's uh, coming about, but potentially it may be driven by persistent antigen that's driving the um, elevation of these antibodies, uh, but that's uh, speculation. Uh, next, we wanted to understand what circulating factors are most distinct between long COVID and non-long COVID uh, participants. And what we found was that the cortisol was the number one um, most differentially um, uh, uh, expressed or differential levels found in long COVID versus uh, the non-long COVID participants. And what we found was that their cortisol level was about half of the healthy control participants level. This is a circulating uh, plasma cortisol level and the uh, cortisol is a very important hormone that's uh, diurnal regulated during the day. And we wanted to make sure that the uh, collection time is about the same between the three groups, which you can see uh, the collection time is uh, roughly around the same time. And so cortisol is a highly regulated hormone that's induced by the hypothalamus uh, pituitary adrenal axis. And the fact that we have lower levels of cortisol, we thought that uh, perhaps there will be a compensatory increase in the um, adrenocorticotropic hormone from the pituitary to restore that level, in which case we did not see such an elevation um, in the long COVID patients, uh, suggesting that there may be some central dysregulation of the cortisol levels in these participants. In addition to cortisol, there were many other uh, cytokines and uh, complement factors and uh, chemokines that were found to be differentially expressed in long COVID patients. Um, what about the dysbiosis or reactivation? Well, we haven't been able to do a microbiome analyses yet, but we have been looking at potential signs of latent virus reactivation. And uh, we used uh, three different orthogonal methods to look at these issues. The first method that we used was the rapid extracellular antigen profiling 
which uh, was developed by Dr. Aaron Ring's laboratory to detect anti antibody reactivity to uh, viral surface proteins and human exoproteome. Uh, using this strategy, uh, as I mentioned to you already, the uh, long COVID participants had elevated levels of antibody reactivity to the receptor binding domain of the spike protein um, throughout uh, different var um, variants of concern. And in addition, very interestingly, we saw elevated levels of IgG against Epstein-Barr virus, a glycoprotein 42, as well as P23 um, and early antigen diffuse. So this, uh, these elevation in IgG levels suggested that there must have been an early, uh, sort of recent reactivation of EBV that happened in the participants uh, with long COVID, but not the other groups. We also saw an elevation in the BCV uh, glycoprotein E uh, reactivity, potentially indicating again, uh, reactivation of BCV. Uh, all the other antigens that were on the panel, there was either no difference or slightly reduced levels, but uh, most of them were not even uh, significant. So uh, I, I told you that we use three different um, uh, orthogonal strategies. The other uh, method that we used is the serimune uh, panel, where uh, we are looking at linear epitope against um, viral antigens. In this case, uh, as I mentioned, the REAP score for the glycoprotein 42 is elevated in long COVID participants. Um, but looking at the serimune data, we also saw uh, quite a, a significant elevation in the long COVID participants for a, a, a linear epitope that is found within the middle of this GP42 viral glycoprotein. And um, interestingly, this GP42 is used specifically by the virus to enter B cells. And when we looked at the relationship between the um, antibody reactivity to EBV antigens on the x-axis and uh, uh, sort of look at the IL-4, IL-6 double positive CD4 T cell levels, there was a positive correlation between these two factors. Um, again, there's uh, just a suggestion of there's a link between EBV reactivation and the double positive um, TH2 cells and there's been a lot of uh, literature in this field that demonstrates that EBV, because the GP42 sort of interferes with the MAC class 2 TCR engagement, uh, tend to drive a Th2 response as opposed to Th1 response, which is the more appropriate antiviral response. And this relationship may be indicating that there's a link between EBV reactivation uh, GP42 um, ex expression and the uh, development of the TH2. But uh, that still needs to be, um, uh, the link has to be um, uh, solidified with more research. Um, and the autoimmunity, so we were uh, very excited about looking at autoimmunity because during the severe acute phase of COVID, we found multiple functional uh, autoantibodies against the human exoproteome uh, against cytokines, um, including interferon alpha and many other cell surface markers that were um, sort of correlating with disease severity. So we used the same REAP approach to identify whether there are autoantibodies against different surface antigens in humans. And this uh, result uh, demonstrates that there really aren't significant difference between uh, people with long COVID versus those without. Uh, with respect to the type of autoantibodies that they uh, have versus, uh, and also the antibody reactivity per uh, patient. Um, and looking at uh, number of reactivity does not correlate with long, long COVID propensity scores um, with, within any of these groups. So um, again, we're not dismissing the importance of autoimmunity, but at least within this cohort, we don't find a significant evidence of autoantibodies and uh, symptoms or um, uh, long COVID status. So taking into account all these factors that, that we measured, we then wanted to identify if there, it, 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 using machine learning, if there's a way of uh, classifying the patients based only on the immune phenotype um, between long COVID and non-long COVID. And that's essentially what we were able to demonstrate uh, with 96% um, uh, confidence that we were able to distinguish people with long COVID based only on the immune phenotype 
And when um, David Van Dyke, our collaborator, uh, who is a computational person, uh, and Rahul in his lab analyzed uh, various different factors contributing to such prediction, uh, we saw that autoantibody had very little contribution to um, the, the, the prediction of long COVID, whereas um, antibody against COVID antigens, um, viral epitopes, these are the ABB reactive antibodies, uh, cytokines and hormones and flow cytometry features were all contributing to this um, separation of long COVID versus non-long COVID groups. And there were specific immunological perturbations that were uh, defining long COVID in, uh, through this machine learning algorithm. And what we found was that the cortisol was the number one factor that was the, the lowest in the long COVID and uh, followed by uh, things like um, uh, the circulating uh, TCM levels being lower and um, some chemokines and CD8 T cell levels, where it was, whereas what was higher in the long COVID were the uh, T cell, the exhausted T cells, both CD4 and CD8s, activated B cells and EBV reactive antibody levels and so on. So we're beginning to see some features associated with long COVID. And again, because there is likely multiple endotypes, uh, we are now seeing the whole picture in a flat surface here, but we'd like to be able to dissociate each subset and, and seeing what the, the root cause driver of these diseases might be. So to summarize, uh, our key findings uh, are that first, the patient reported outcomes alone were actually also significant uh, and sufficient to identify long COVID patients which I didn't have time to talk about, but I'd really encourage you to look at our preprint. Um, as I mentioned, the immunophenotyping does reveal increased in, uh, increases in exhausted T cells, these Th2 type of uh, T cells, as well as activated B cells and non-classical monocytes. Um, SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody responses are elevated in long COVID patients. Now that doesn't mean that these antibodies are necessarily neutralizing or functional. All we're saying is that there's an elevation in these antibody levels. Uh, we also saw evidence of herpes virus reactivation, particularly EBV, and there was no uh, significant differences in autoantibodies to extracellular proteome in uh, using REAP. Uh, the machine learning really is telling us long COVID can be efficiently predicted from immunological data alone, and low cortisol levels were the strongest predictor of both defining long COVID as well as uh, disease severity. So putting all this together with many other papers that are emerging, uh, we feel that uh, so far the autoantibody um, may or may not be playing a role, but don't, we don't see a significant um, si signature of this yet, uh, at least in our own studies and a couple of other papers. Uh, we also see that there may be this viral reservoir or viral um, antigens or PAMPs that are being um, remaining in some tissues now we only look at the peripheral blood, so we cannot talk anything about the tissue itself, but it may be reporting on some of these. Uh, consistent with that idea is the elevated antibody levels and uh, these sort of chronic levels of some of these inflammatory cytokines that are elevated. Uh, we also see latent virus reactivation of EBV and potentially VZB. Uh, and this may be happening in a subset of um, patients. And tissue damage, again, we didn't look at this in our study, but I'm sure you'll hear a lot more from Jim about this. Um, so I'm just gonna end by like talking about what research is needed. There's so much that's needed, but uh, we don't really have a good grasp of global epidemiology of long COVID, which is really important and necessary. Uh, we need to identify risk factors. We need to understand the endotypes. Once we understand the endotypes and the driver of diseases, then we can look at biomarkers for these endotypes, as well as potentially rational treatment options that target the root cause of these diseases. And even if that's not possible, we can target the downstream um, pathology, such as uh, microclots and um, platelet activation and vascular dysfunction that's occurring in many of these patients. So I'll end here by thanking the people who are involved. There are just so many people involved. I'm just a messenger here. Um, the first authors I've already kind of highlighted before from my own lab, as well as uh, many other laboratories uh, throughout Yale. Uh, David Petrino um, was a key um, contributor to the study that I mentioned today. 
Uh, we also have a, another study ongoing called Yale Listen Study that Harlan Kromholtz and I are leading. Um, and then all the people who are um, sort of critical for the analysis part of the study that I mentioned, Aaron Ring, uh, Rasan Mezitov, David Van Dyke, um, Wei Schultz and Sarah Moon, um, and Amy uh, and I, we are collaborating on multiple fronts, including MECFS research, and lots of uh, folks that contributed to the, the mouse work that I briefly mentioned. So thank you so much for listening. My name is uh, Jim Stone, and I'm thrilled to talk to you today about the pathology of SARS-CoV-2 infection and the implications for the biologic mechanisms underlying PASC. So PASC basically involves uh, symptoms that the patients are feeling uh, following the acute phase of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And these, of course, can involve uh, many different organ systems. And I'm going to try to go through some of these organ systems and show what we know, and in some cases, what we don't know about the pathology in these organs. Next slide. So clearly a major site of involvement of the virus is the lungs. And in the acute phase, the um, primary pathology is what's called diffuse alveolar damage. And you see this in the uh, top row of images, particularly in the middle where the astrocytes are highlighting these red rings, which are hyaline membranes characteristic of diffuse alveolar damage. There's also uh, neutrophilic infiltrates, which you can see in the middle row on the left. Uh, these are typically seen uh, when you have coexistent bacterial infections or sometimes fungal infections. Uh, on the far right in the middle, you can have mucin plugs uh, plugging up the airways in the lungs. In the bottom left, there's chronic inflammatory infiltrates. And in the bottom right, uh, we see a microthrombus. And microthrombi are certainly a common feature in the acute phase of, of the disease, particularly in the lungs. In the center, you see an immunohistochemical stain showing the presence of virus. Early in the pandemic, this was all we had were existing antibodies to the virus. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to largely move on from immunohistochemistry. Uh, next slide. So in situ hybridization is really the gold standard for localizing virus within the tissues now. This was one of the very early studies uh, out of uh, Mass General showing uh, in situ hybridization for the virus within the lung tissue. There's a hyaline membrane, the red uh, area on the, on the left. And then on the right, all of those red dots basically represent uh, amplified viral RNA uh, within a hyaline membrane. Next slide. So the major, uh, many of the major hospitals in the Boston area contributed to uh, a single cell uh, atlas, basically, of pulmonary infection in the acute phase of SARS-CoV-2. And what came from this single cell analysis, which was uh, led by the Broad Institute, was that there were many cell types that actually contained virus within the lung tissue. Uh, the most frequent cell type to harbor virus were myeloid cells, but this may have been in part due to the fact that the epithelial cells uh, were largely wiped out in many of these patients. But certainly there's many different cell types, even within the myeloid lineage, there are many different types of myeloid cells can contain virus. And endothelial cells as, as well uh, contain virus within the lungs, including many different types of endothelial cells. Next slide. So as that diffuse alveolar damage um, starts to organize for, for patients that are able to survive that acute phase, uh, that's really severe acute phase. Initially, you'll go through a state of organizing diffuse alveolar damage, and that's what you see in the top right. And I should say this is a study uh, out of the Mayo Clinic. And in some cases, that organizing diffuse alveolar damage, where you have a granulation tissue phenomenon forming, uh, in some cases, that will progress to scarring. And in the bottom right, you see basically dense scar tissue within the lungs, pulmonary fibrosis. And unfortunately, this is largely irreversible. And certainly some patients uh, who have PASC actually uh, who survive severe acute phase disease uh, may actually have scarring in the lungs that explain their symptoms. So that certainly some uh, one subset of PASC patients uh, are suffering from scar tissue in the lungs. Next slide. So the question is, how long can virus remain in the lungs? And uh, there's been several studies now that address this. This is one of the earlier ones that came out last year from Spain, uh, showing that virus can be detected in lung tissue at autopsy up to 108 days from the onset of infection. Uh, 
uh, in the right half of the boxes, each box represents a different lobe of the lung. And notice that uh, the colored boxes are boxes where, um, or lobes where virus was detected. And not every lobe necessarily had detectable virus in a given patient. And it really underscores the need uh, to do uh, extensive sampling um, by PCR when you're trying to identify um, how many patients actually have residual virus. Next slide. So uh, we launched a multi-center uh, study to look at the heart very early in the pandemic. And, and this was a, a study uh, through the Society of Cardiovascular Pathology and the uh, European Association for Cardiovascular Pathology. And we were quickly able to identify in patients dying from severe acute phase uh, COVID-19 that there were multiple pathologies in the heart explaining the troponin elevations in these patients. Uh, some of the patients did have myocarditis. Uh, a, a number did have microvascular thrombi giving rise to ischemic injury. And there were other pathologies such as right ventricular strain injury uh, where the, the right uh, myocytes in the right ventricle were actually dying because of the elevated pulmonary pressures of all the, of all the lung disease. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of these in more detail. Next slide. So this is uh, an example of the myocarditis. Now this is an uncommon finding. Certainly the majority of patients uh, do not develop myocarditis by any means. Um, but you see basically these diffuse, in some patients, these diffuse lymphocytic infiltrates, uh, which are damaging the muscle. Next slide. At higher power, um, you can see this foci of, of inflammation composed of lymphocytes and macrophages, and there's disruption of the muscle in several areas. Now, in COVID, this is usually a CD4 predominant process, and it is usually multifocal and not diffuse. And it's one of the reasons why endomyocardial biopsy often is not very successful in identifying the myocarditis in these patients. Next slide. Uh, there's also diffuse inflammation in most of these patients, even if it doesn't rise to the level of myocarditis. In this particular example, we're seeing a diffuse macrophage infiltration uh, with CD68 positive macrophages. In severe acute phase disease, most of the patients will have uh, a, an increase in diffuse inflammation in the heart, even if it's not myocarditis. Uh, next slide. There's also pericarditis in a fraction of patients. And interestingly, sometimes this is actually CD8 predominant in contrast to the typical CD4 predominance of the lymphocytes and the myocarditis in these patients. Next slide. So early in the pandemic, there was a big question about whether the virus actually could involve organs outside of the lungs. Um, we knew that patients were undergoing uh, viremia. In fact, about two thirds of patients who had severe acute phase disease had virus detected uh, in the plasma. We also knew that if you looked at heart tissue, uh, fresh heart tissue in patients succumbing to the acute phase of the disease, about two thirds of them had virus detectable in the heart tissue, but it really wasn't clear if this was just because it was in the blood or actually making it into the tissue. Uh, we should uh, keep in mind that the virus is a single-stranded RNA virus, as you see on the left, and it's really the positive strand that's uh, incorporated into the intact virion. And when it enters the cell, sorry, go back, when it enters the cell, it will make a reverse strand or a negative strand, and it can also make subgenomic sequences. And either the reverse strand or the subgenomic sequences can be helpful to detect viral replication. Next slide. So, by using the ISH technology, uh, many groups now have been able to show that virus is in fact in the myocardium itself. And in our experience, most of the, the ISH positive cells, which is usually a positive strand ISH, is detecting interstitial cells between the heart muscle cells, probably macrophages or, my, or myeloid cells of some type. Uh, this can be associated with either myocarditis and in a minority of cases, or some degree of inflammation not rising to the level of myocarditis in most cases. Next slide. These uh, ish positive cells uh, actually do correlate with the presence of uh, markers of replication. In this particular study, uh, looking at full transcript, full RNA profiling of the virus with nanostring, uh, what you can see is that the positive strand uh, ish positive cells do correlate quite well 
with the presence of the reverse strand of the virus in the heart tissue, indicating some degree of viral replication. Um, next slide. Notice there is this one case where the ish was negative, but there's a lot of positive uh, signal for, for the positive strand, but not for the reverse strand. And this is what you expect for circulating virion. So, so when you're carefully looking at the tissue, you can distinguish between virus in the tissue versus virus in the blood. And it is making its way into the heart tissue. Next slide. So I told you most of the cells in the heart that are positive by ish are these interstitial cells. You can occasionally see uh, endothelial cells as you see in the top left. And in our patients who were heavily anticoagulated with usually with therapeutic heparin levels, uh, the presence of virus in the endothelial cells actually correlated with the presence of the CD61 positive platelet microthrombi. Also in the bottom left, we occasionally see virus within myocytes themselves. And when virus is present within the myocyte, it actually correlates with the presence of myocarditis. But again, myocarditis is an uncommon feature of this disease. Next slide. So inflammation in general is a pretty common feature uh, in patients with both acute phase, and here we're going out almost to 50 days. So we're really talking about extended acute phase. Uh, both for lymphocytes and macrophages. There's a strong correlation with time from the onset of symptoms to death in these patients dying from a severe acute phase. And it turns out that this correlation is largely related to the presence of virus in the muscle. There's really not a correlation in the pa patients who did not have virus in the myocardium. So virus in the myocardium seems to be driving this time-dependent increase in inflammation in the myocardium in this subset of patients. Now, the question becomes, what about patients who don't die of the acute phase? Uh, some of these patients uh, rarely will present in heart failure with imaging findings of myocarditis. Some are not, most are not imaged. This was an example from a medical student at Indiana University who wrote up her own case report who was suffering from myocarditis. So even though you may not have severe acute phase disease, you can of course develop myocarditis uh, subsequently after having SARS-CoV-2, but it is rare in this setting. But what we don't really know is for the vast majority of people who don't go into heart failure, what is happening to the inflammation within their myocardium uh, after they recover from COVID-19. This is, or when they're in the post-acute phase of COVID-19. We just don't know. Next slide. So moving on to the olfactory epithelium, uh, there was a lot of questions of what was going on in this location, given the anosmia that many people were experiencing. And it turns out that the virus appears to mostly be in, affecting the, um, the uh, sustenticular cells, which you see on the left two panels, where the red is the red virus is correlating with the blue, uh, it does not tend to co-localize with the neurons, uh, which explains why in some patients the anosmia is transient because the sustenticular cells can simply uh, reproduce and replenish after they're injured. Next slide. But this isn't the full story. This was a study out of Hopkins showing that there's other changes such as axonal injury in the olfactory tissue. Uh, and you can see the different stages of axonal injury in the top left. And the patients with COVID-19 not only have more axonal injury in the olfactory tissue than the controls, but those with abnormal sense of smell actually have more axonal injury than those with normal sense of smell, uh, even though they had COVID-19. And this unfortunately may not um, change or, or, re or reverse rapidly, of course. It may even be permanent, which is why some people may not regain their sense of smell. Next slide. So in the brain, there are changes during the acute phase of COVID-19. Again, micro hemorrhages, as you see in the top left, and these areas of axonal injury uh, where you have increase in macrophages and loss of uh, blue staining on Luxolfast blue. Unfortunately, these have not really been correlated with, these types of changes have not been uh, correlated with virus and may simply represent uh, changes secondary to the acute setting of the disease and the cytokine storm and microthrombi seen in the acute phase. Next slide. However, virus can be detected in the brain. And this is in fact a study um, out of Banner Sun Health uh, 
looking at different brain regions. And this was a very extensive study doing up to 80 PCR reactions per patient. And the key point to this study was that the most uh, significant area containing virus, the, the area with the highest levels of virus was actually the olfactory bulb, uh, which does seem to correlate with some of the other changes and symptoms that patients are having. Next slide. The peripheral nerves can also be involved. Uh, this was a study out of MGH showing that in patients with peripheral neuropathy, uh, presenting with clinical peripheral neuropathy on skin biopsy, uh, the majority of them, 63%, uh, actually had abnormally low levels of epidermal neurite density, indicating that there are changes occurring in the peripheral nerves in the setting of long COVID. Next slide. So this was a study out of Rockefeller showing that virus can be routinely detected in the GI tract. And these are examples from the small bowel. And if you look at the far right, the green dots are representing virus within the small bowel. And this is up to 173 days from the onset of infection. Interestingly though, uh, this was not associated with any specific pathologic changes. Next slide. So the pancreas is important because some of these patients develop uh, new onset diabetes following the acute phase of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this was a, a study out of uh, Europe showing that the virus can actually localize within the islets of the pancreas uh, and not only localize there, but inflammation is more intense in the islets of the pancreas compared with controls. But again, it's not a specific finding as you can see this inflammation and in sepsis as well. Next slide. So a very important study that, that did come out very recently uh, was the study from NIH showing that you can detect virus by DDPCR in numerous organs throughout the body. And I've, I've uh, altered their figure a little so you could easily look at different regions of the body, respiratory, cardiovascular, lymphoid, GI. One of the things you notice when you're looking at different time frames, the acute phase, what, what these patients probably were in extended acute phase at 31 to 50 days. Um, some of them may have been early post-acute phase, but then the true post-acute phase at 51 to 230 days. Certainly you see the level of virus going down as the red color is more intense and the bluish colors are less intense. But also when you look at the post-acute phase patients, you don't see an obvious reservoir. You see a smattering of virus in a lot of different organs. And this is certainly one of the challenges that we face in trying to identify the reservoir. The vertical lines I should point out is the subgenomic RNA, which initially is mostly in the lungs, but also in other organs as well. And it does decrease in, in frequency as well over time. Next slide. So the viral load decreases in both the respiratory and non-respiratory tissues over time to the point that they basically equilibrate. And even though the lungs and the upper respiratory tract have high levels at the beginning, they end up equilibrating to the point that all organs are very similar uh, once you get beyond uh, six months. The question is what's happening after here? Because notice that both of these lines are intersecting those last group of patients at the bottom part. The question, uh, is this really flattening out or not? Next, next slide. So is this going down or flattening out? And clearly more studies over longer periods of time are gonna be important to understand how long virus is persisting within different organs in the body. Next slide. So let me just wrap up with, at sites of high viral load, like the respiratory tract, there can be permanent tissue damage during the acute phase, which may explain some forms of PASC. There's low level of extra pulmonary organ involvement by SARS-CoV-2 in both acute and post-acute phases, but viral persistence in these extra pulmonary sites in the post-acute phase may play a role in some forms of PASC, but the cited nature of the reservoir uh, still is somewhat unclear. And it's very important that we are able to have more studies correlating pathologic changes with both viral persistence and symptoms uh, in the post-acute phase of COVID-19. All right, thank you. I will go next. I'm also very glad to be here. I'm gonna give an overview of SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in long COVID packs and follow up on some of what James just talked about. 
So there's a variety, as Akiko emphasized, a variety of bi biological factors that can contribute to long COVID or PAC symptoms in different patients. But several core biological trends have emerged as potential primary drivers of PAX pathology. And a growing body of evidence does suggest that a significant portion of PAX patients may not fully clear the SARS-CoV-2 virus after acute infection. And instead, a small amount of viral RNA potentially capable of translation and the production of viral proteins may persist in patient tissue as a reservoir. And this persistent could, could modulate the local host immune response or lead to the ongoing or periodic release of viral antigen into the circulation. So there are a number of different studies now that show evidence of SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in samples collected from patients after acute COVID or in samples collected from patients with PACs. And the findings are compelling, but of course, all require further replication in additional cohorts. But nevertheless, evidence for viral reservoir and PACs so far comes from about three categories of research. And these are one, research demonstrating that SARS-CoV-2 RNA and protein are capable of persistence in a wide range of body and brain sites. Two, research that has identified SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein in PAC samples or correlated identification of RNA and protein with PAC symptoms. And three, research on T or B cell activity, the adaptive immune response that may reflect SARS-CoV-2 persistence in PACs. Now for the first category of research, studies that show SARS-CoV-2 capable of persistence in a wide range of body sites. The NIH autopsy study that James just described in his talk is a prime example of this research. To recap, the team identified SARS-CoV-2 RNA and protein in various tissues of autopsy cases in which samples were obtained in, in some instances at least 31 days after acute COVID symptom onset. And 50% of these late cases had persistent RNA in the lymph nodes from the head and neck, from the thorax, in sciatic nerve, in ocular tissue, and in most sampled regions of the central nervous system, including the cervical spinal cord and the basal ganglia, with subgenomic messenger RNA, a potential marker of recent viral replication, also identified in tissue obtained from some of these late cases indicating that SARS-CoV-2 replication may occur in non-respiratory tissues for several months at least after acute COVID. And beyond this study, there are several other autopsy studies or studies where tissue samples were collected via biopsy or surgical procedures from patients that have also found SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein in samples weeks or months after acute COVID. For example, this team found SARS-CoV-2 in nucleocapted antigen and olfactory mucosa samples collected from four patients with ongoing loss of smell after acute COVID, with samples collected between 110 days to 196 days after COVID onset. And a takeaway from this research is that studies of past blood alone are unlikely to reflect the extent of potential SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in the same patient's tissue. For example, in the NIH autopsy study, SARS-CoV-2 RNA was detected in a perimortem plasma sample in only 12 of 44 cases, and negligible if any RNA was detected in banked PBMCs from representative cases. And it's also important to consider that SARS-CoV-2 persistence in PACs may differ by cell type or body site due to differences in the local immune environment or the lifetime or turnover of infected cells. For example, viral persistence in long-lived cells, such as neurons or cardiac myocytes, may be different than viral persistence in gut epithelial cells that turn over more rapidly. So more research is needed. And another thing to understand is that in nearly all studies where SARS-CoV-2 has been identified in acute COVID in tissue, the same subjects tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 via standard nasal PCR testing. In fact, in that olfactory study, where subjects harbored persistent SARS-CoV-2 RNA and antigen in an olfactory mucosa samples, the tissue of the nose, the same subjects tested negative for SARS-CoV-2 via routine nasal swab PCR. And here is another example. The team identified SARS-CoV-2 RNA and spike protein in the stool of 11 of 14 newborn babies born to mothers who had COVID that resolved 10 or more weeks prior to delivery. This suggests in utero transmission of the virus and intestinal SARS-CoV-2 reservoirs in the newborns. And all newborns that harbored SARS-CoV-2 RNA in stool were negative for the virus via nasal swab PCR. And will these newborns develop symptoms, symptoms of pox? We don't know, but stool homogenates from 14 of the newborns elicited increased production of IL-6 and interferon gamma from macrophage in vitro relative to non-COVID controls. So it's a very concerning finding, and it's just one of the reasons why the study of SARS-CoV-2 persistence is so important.
Then we come to the second category of research, research that has identified SARS-CoV-2 RNA and protein in PAC samples or correlated identification of RNA and protein with PAC symptoms. There are teams that have identified SARS-CoV-2 or RNA and protein in PAX tissue acquired via biopsy procedures. For example, this team identified SARS-CoV-2 RNA and nucleocapsid protein in skin, appendix, and breast tissues of two patients who exhibited PAX symptoms 163 and 426 days after symptom onset. In this Stanford team tracked patients after COVID and found that four months after diagnosis, 12.7% still had SARS-CoV-2 RNA in stool. After seven months, 3.8% of subjects did. And two individuals continued to shed RNA in stool at about 210 days post-infection. Importantly, PAC symptoms, including GI symptoms and systemic and respiratory symptoms, were associated with the presence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in stool. And there are different ways to interpret these findings. You could say, oh, good, persistent SARS-CoV-2 RNA seems to clear from most patients who've had COVID over time. Or you could say, maybe over time, persistent SARS-CoV-2 moves out of stool and deeper into the same patient's GI tissue, where it can only be identified via tissue biopsy or autopsy studies, which is why tissue biopsy studies are a very important focus of many PAX research teams that we are working with. Now, this team used a convenient sample of inflammatory bowel disease patients undergoing routine colonoscopy or endoscopy to investigate the possibility that the gut may serve as a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir site. And despite mild acute cases, 77% of patients had SARS-CoV-2 RNA in gut mucosa about seven months after acute COVID. Viral nucleocapsid protein was also identified in gut epithelium and in CD8 T cells in 52% of these patients. Viral RNA and protein persistence were unrelated to the severity of acute COVID or immunosuppressive therapy, but they did associate with PAC symptoms. In fact, only patients with detectable viral RNA and mucosal tissue reported symptoms compatible with PACs. Now, a question with these findings is, can infectious virus be detected in samples? And that's because detection of infectious virus is gold standard for identification of replicating virus. And in the study I just showed you, the team did not succeed in culturing infectious virus from the intestinal or mucosal gut samples with persistent RNA and protein in their cohort. But there are considerations with culture when it comes to persistent RNA viruses. First, there are technical limitations. Culture usually requires co-cultivation with susceptible cells and may be influenced by the presence of neutralizing antibody in sample. But most importantly, mechanisms have been delineated whereby persistent RNA viruses deliberately suppress the production of infectious virions to facilitate the survival of the cells they've infected. And this facilitates persistence. For example, they acquire mutations that decrease virion assembly or decrease RNA synthesis. Indeed, the acquisition of viral mutations is a well-established mechanism that facilitates the persistence of certain RNA viruses, including measles and even other coronaviruses. In this review by Diane Griffin at Johns Hopkins, called Why Does Viral RNA Sometimes Persist After Recovery from Acute Infection is critical to read to understand these mechanisms. It's a must read if you're studying viral reservoir impacts. Another consideration when interpreting findings on viral reservoir impacts is that overt inflammation does not have to be identified near persistent SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein for disease processes to occur. For example, in that NIH autopsy study of SARS-CoV-2 persistence throughout the body and brain, the team observed little evidence of inflammation or direct viral cytopathology in much of the tissue they examined from cases after acute COVID. But persistent virus may downregulate the immune response to drive disease as opposed to activating it. In fact, SARS-CoV-2 expresses several proteins that downregulate the host immune response, including host interferon signaling. Also, if a virus like SARS-CoV-2 is able to gain access to the nucleus, to the center of the cells that it infects, it can directly interfere with human transcription, translation, DNA repair processes, and even the epigenetic environment. So to better understand what is happening in PACs with viral reservoir, we need to use sequencing technologies on patient tissue samples to deeply characterize host immune and gene expression changes near identified SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein. Now, returning to evidence for SARS-CoV-2 reservoir and PACs, other teams have identified SARS-CoV-2 protein in PAX plasma months after acute COVID. 
This German team measured circulating SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein in PAC subjects and controls, which were prior COVID individuals who did not develop PACs. And because S1 protein has been detected in plasma after vaccination, they restricted their analysis to individuals without prior vaccination. And in the PACs group, circulating S1 was detected in around 64% of individuals. And the PACs group also showed higher circulating S1 levels as compared to controls. However, about 35% of the controls did show measurable levels of circulating S1 protein. Now then, this Harvard team used optimized ultra-sensitive single molecule array SAMOA assays to look for SARS-CoV-2 antigen in Pax plasma. And they did identify either spike, S1, or nucleocapsid protein in about 65% of plasma samples collected from Pax subjects several months after acute infection. Spike was detected most often in 60% of patients up to 12 months post-COVID with no spike detected in controls, which were, again, COVID patients who did not develop PACs. In PACs cases where the team obtained longitudinal samples, viral protein was detected at more than one sampling time point in 12 patients. Now, how do we interpret these findings? Why is viral protein or antigen being identified alone in PACs plasma as opposed to the virus itself? Well, there's much more research needed on the topic, but one hypothesis is that SARS-CoV-2 itself may persist in Pax tissue reservoir sites, but full length uncleaved spike antigen may regularly butt off the virus or infected cells. And because spike is a transmembrane protein, it may circulate associated with a membrane in exosomes, small extracellular membrane vesicles, and enter the bloodstream via that transport. And indeed, this UCSF team did identify our higher mean levels of SARS-CoV-2 S1 and nucleocapsid protein in enriched plasma neuron and astrocyte-derived vesicles, extracellular vesicles, in PAX patients as compared to resolved acute COVID controls. And I know that this team and the Harvard team are pursuing extended research on this topic of the antigen and exosomes. And it's worth noting that if these findings of SARS-CoV-2 antigen and plasma hold, they also strongly suggest that SARS-CoV-2 and RNA with in pa patients with PAX is going through periods of replication. Otherwise, it is hard to explain why viral antigen would regularly be found in plasma and not cleared away. Now, three, we come to this third category of research on viral persistence in PAX, research on tier B cell activity that may reflect persistence of the virus. And these are important. Uh, this is an important area of research because the adaptive immune response can be used as a very sensitive detector of viral persistence. Because with transcription based technologies, you can elucidate the specific stage of a tier B cell's lifespan, including a very recent detection of antigen. And it follows that studies of antibody secreting cells, T cells, and B cells and related immune cell activity can be used to infer the presence of SARS CoV 2 reservoir in patients with PAX. Here's one study that went in that direction. The team found that in pulmonary PAX patients, when compared to recovered controls, had between six to 105-fold higher frequencies of interferon gamma and TNF-producing SARS-CoV-2-specific CD4 and CD8 T cells in peripheral blood using stimulation with peptide pools from multiple SARS-CoV-2 proteins. And SARS-CoV-2-specific TNF-producing CD8 T cells had high Ki67, which is a marker of recent proliferation, suggesting recent antigen stimulation in the PAX patients in the study, with the antigen stimulation likely being tied to viral reservoir. More research needed. Here is a study where B cell activity strongly supports the finding that study subjects harbored a SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in tissue. The team collected pharyngeal lymphoid tissue, a mix of tonsil and adenoid tissue from non-vaccinated COVID convalescent children undergoing surgery. And the majority of tissue samples examined were positive for SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid RNA, despite negative nasal swab PCRs in the same children at the time of surgery. And in fact, four of the children whose tissue was examined in the study had suffered from COVID at least 100 days before surgery, including one 303 days before surgery. Viral nucleocapsid RNA was not identified, by the way, in tissues from any infected controls, only in the, the children um, with evidence of COVID infection. Now, coming back to the B cell signaling, the team identified persistent expansion of germinal center and antiviral lymphocyte populations associated with interferon gamma type responses in the children's tissue. And single B cell receptor sequencing indicated viral specific 
SARS-CoV-2 specific B cell receptors were class switched and somatically hypermutated. SARS-CoV-2 RNA copies in tissue significantly correlated with the percentages of S1 receptor binding domain positive B cells among germinal center B cells in lymphoid tonsil tissue. And this raises the strong possibility that it's SARS-CoV-2 antigen persistence as part of a viral reservoir in these children that contributed to the prolonged lymphoid and germinal cell responses in the study subjects. And you can tell from this how you can then use this, the adaptive immune response to infer the potential uh, presence of antigen in the same study subject. Now, this study, that study did not measure symptoms in the children, so we don't know if they had PAC symptoms, although they were undergoing surgery for sleep disordered breathing or obstructive sleep apnea, which might have impacted the findings. But overall, it's important to note that multiple studies have identified SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein in patients who were asymptomatic at the time of sample collection. So further research is needed to better understand factors that may lead to the development of specific symptoms in PACS patients harboring SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein. And these factors include location of infection, transcriptional and translational activity of SARS-CoV-2 RNA, and human genome mutations or HLA haplotypes that may predispose to differences in host innate or adaptive immune responses to persistent viral RNA or antigen that lead to symptoms in certain patients. Now, in my last few minutes, I wanna quickly discuss the relationship between SARS-CoV-2 reservoir and other biological abnormalities that have also been identified in PAX patients. For example, this South African team used fluorescence microscopy to demonstrate the presence of fibrin amyloid microclots resistant to fibrinolysis or breakdown in platelet-poor plasma samples collected from PAC subjects. And several teams that we work with at different institutions have preliminary data that replicates these findings. Now, it's possible that PAX patients who have microclots do not harbor SARS-CoV-2 reservoir, but the two factors can be connected. In a separate study by the same South African team, the team added the SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein to healthy platelet poor plasma. That resulted in structural changes to fibrinogen, including resistance to trypsinization that are very similar to the fibrin deposits identified in the PAX microclots. And other teams have also identified SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in COVID thrombi, or reported that SARS-CoV-2 spike protein can bind to fibrinogen and induce structurally abnormal blood clots with heightened pro-inflammatory activity. So it may be that SARS-CoV-2 reservoir and microclotting are connected. And remember that German team did find SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein in a high proportion of plasma samples in their PAX cohort. Now, there are also studies that have found microbiome alterations or imbalances in patients with PAX or signs of intestinal permeability and the translocation of organisms from the gut into the bloodstream. For example, this team documented higher levels of fungal translocation as measured by beta-glucan, a fungal wall cell polysaccharide in the plasma of PAX patients as compared to controls. And they also found that PAX was associated in increased plasma levels of zonulin, which is a biomarker of intestinal permeability. The translocation of organisms from gut to blood could happen in PAX patients without SARS-CoV-2 reservoir, but it is possible for the two factors to be connected. For example, this team studied children with MIS-C, a severe SARS-CoV-2 related inflammatory disorder with strong parallels to PAX. And they found that children with MIS-C harbored SARS-CoV-2 RNA in stool weeks after initial infection. And this persistence of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in stool was accompanied by significantly increased release of zonulin, that marker, a biomarker of intestinal permeability, and the identification of SARS-CoV-2 antigen in plasma. So it may be possible that it is the inflammation associated with viral RNA persistence in the GI tract that is part of what facilitates breakdown of the gut mucosal barrier in these children and facilitates the translocation of viral antigen into the bloodstream, leading to hyperinflammation in certain cases. In other words, the GI persistence of SARS-CoV-2 and other issues like intestinal permeability, leakage of antigen, or even microbiome issues may be connected. Another finding demonstrated in multiple PAC studies is reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus in at least a subset of patients. Epstein-Barr virus reactivation could happen in PAX patients without SARS-CoV-2 reservoir, but the two factors could also be connected. 
That's because SARS-CoV-2 expresses multiple proteins that allow it to counteract interferons. And interferons are the primary class of antiviral cytokine that play a central role in successful control of all viral infection, including EBV infection and latency. So a PAX patient with SARS-CoV-2 reservoir may be more likely to have EBV reactivate in the same immune environment. And I could go on. I could talk about mechanisms by which SARS-CoV-2 reservoir could contribute to changes in neuroimmune signaling in patients with PACs or affect pathways that can contribute to neuroinflammation or even neuropathy. But overall, the takeaway is that we should study SARS-CoV-2 reservoir impacts in concert with other uh, related biological factors in the disease. And I think that's how we will get the most rapid clarity on what is happening in, in PACs patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to take this opportunity again to thank our uh, speakers for their engaging presentations. And so before we begin the panel discussion, I just want to give a brief recap on some of the main themes that were presented today as a primer for this year's Recover R3 series on the pathobiology and mechanisms of PASC. And so many hypotheses were raised today, and we hope that you will follow the series um, throughout the year as some of these um, pathways will be discussed in more detail, and we hope that you'll participate in these future seminars. So we kicked off today's series with the foundational concept that post-acute viral syndromes are not new and can occur with many different pathogens. However, clinical presentations of these syndromes can vary widely, and while there's high value in shared learning across these syndromes, there's also strong rationale to do a deep dive into them individually. This was supported with data uh, for the unique immunopathology of COVID and strategies using clinical data machine learning and immunoprofiling in the long COVID clinic to systematically narrow down several hypotheses about contributing factors to PASC, such as latent virus reactivation, residual tissue damage, and persistence of viral pathogens. And next, we saw evidence on how acute infection can result in residual tissue damage in the heart, lungs, olfactory tissues, the brain, and GI tract, all of which that um, can be linked to long-term symptoms in PASC. This was presented in well-documented, thorough, and rigorous autopsy and tissue histopathology studies. Additionally, it was noted that tissue pathology after the post-acute phase can vary, and understanding this variation may also help us understand how residual tissue damage may contribute to the long-term pathology seen in PASC. And this is an ongoing area of research. It was also noted that understanding key factors such as underlying comorbid conditions at the time of infection is also important. Finally, the duration of local inflammation related to viral load and infection at extrapulmonary sites were noted as potential predict predictors of the onset and severity to PASC. Finally, across the presentations was the hypothesis of viral persistence, including persistence of virus or viral products as potential mediators to PASC. Limitations to prior research were noted, such as understanding what tissues are at the actual reservoirs and how long does the virus need to persist in that area to perpetuate immune inflammation and how to best uh, sample these tissues, i.e. Uh, what tissues should be sampled and what te techniques are needed to uh, be employed and when and how to sample. Current progress in these areas was presented, but open questions still remain. The majority of questions of uh, how the virus um, can cause such widespread and diverse pathology after acute infection is uh, still a really big ongoing area of research. An additional focus on viral persistence will actually be the next topic for the R3 uh, seminar series later this month. So with that, um, I'd like to try to get a couple of questions in to the panel. Um, the first one is, um, related to a few of the audience questions that were submitted prior to the seminar today and also in the Q&A tool is really how are we translating the information that was presented today into treatment and to care of those affected by PASC? Given um, where we are and what we know now about risk factors, and um, several solid plausible hypotheses that were presented for the mechanisms of PASC, including those today, how are we translating these into the PASC clinic, ensuring that key specialties are represented and the right testing is being done 
to identify the most likely pathways and helping to um, rapidly identify subsets of past patients and potential treatment options. So uh, maybe I'll open that to Dr. Iwasaki first. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, that was a great summary um, you just gave us. Thank you so much. Um, so how are these basic insights leading to treatment options? That's a, that's a very important question. And I know so many people are waiting uh, to be treated for uh, their debilitating symptoms. That, that is why I emphasize uh, the importance of uh, trying to understand the endotypes of long COVID. Uh, let's say if the viral persistence was the main driver of long COVID in a subset of patients, if we can find biomarkers to subset those patients, then we can start providing them with appropriate medicine like uh, antivirals or monoclonal antibodies or um, something to get rid of the viral reservoir. Um, if it's just RNA alone, uh, it might be a little bit difficult to get at that, but if there's some protein involvement, we can still use antibodies and other measures. If it's a replicating virus, um, Paxlovid and other antivirals may be a, a viable way of treating these types of diseases. However, if it turns out that subset of uh, patients are you know, suffering from autoimmunity, uh, antivirals are not gonna work. So there we might have to employ um, uh, anti-inflammatories or um, immune uh, antibodies against cytokines or um, JAK inhibitors, things to pump down the, uh, uh, the autoimmune components. Um, and I, again, understanding what biomarkers might indicate people suffering from autoimmunity versus viral persistence uh, would be very helpful in categorizing patients for treatment options. And if let's say latent reactivation of EBV is contributing to the symptoms, there are antivirals that are, you know, potentially useful in that area as well against the EBV um, and other DNA viruses. Uh, and, and so, you know, understanding which type uh, is, is, is uh, present in, in which patients is a key first understanding to um, even suggesting what the appropriate treatments are. But at the same time, it, this is a very urgent issue. People are really desperate for therapy. And I think we should go ahead and do a, um, a well character, well designed uh, randomized clinical trials to see like what patients are benefiting before and after and have biomarkers that correlate with that response. And that way, without knowing the molecular mechanism, we can start to understand by experiments and, uh, and sort of measurements of these patients who might benefit and how that can inform future therapy options. So I, I'm giving you like two ways to approach this, but they should be done at the same time. Thank you. So Dr. Stone, do you have anything to add related to how the um, tissue pathology studies are translating into potential um, clinical interventions? So it's, it's unfortunately a long time course. It takes a while to develop therapies. I think the tissue pathology studies are supportive of the fact that they're for patients who are suffering, we're saying, yes, there is indeed something going on and we're seeing it. We are seeing viral persistence. Uh, we are seeing some changes in the tissue, uh, but it's going to be difficult to really sort out what the proper target is uh, and whether it's inflammation or whether it's virus without inflammation. Um, that's the, the, the issue. And I know people really want us to be launching into therapies right away, but it does take time to figure out the right therapy so that we do more, more good than harm as we try to launch new therapeutic trials. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna close this question out with Dr. Peral and ask you to follow up on maybe um, what potential biomarkers seem most interesting and most valuable for us to translate into the clinic related to some of the things that you presented in your talk. And then I'll give it to um, Lisa to do the audience questions. Sure, so I think that one of the top potential biomarkers would be if those studies in which antigen was found um, in plasma are there's a decent hope there that if those studies are they have to be replicated in other cohorts we have to still see for example I do think that the Harvard team that used the very sensitive Samoa assay to find spike in plasma I do think they did work on a different cohort that had had more infection after Omicron and didn't see the same level of spikes so there's going to be a lot of considerations with these studies and yet 
being able to identify antigen in plasma would be huge because plasma is regularly collected, more easy, most easily collected from patients because it is a big challenge here when we're thinking, when we're seeing a lot of tissue-based pathology happening in PACs. And so we have, you know, the virus may be in someone's nerve or in someone's uh, tissue sample, but of course, biopsying, getting biopsy from patients can be difficult. That being said, our long COVID research consortium is working on some tissue types that can be biopsied, for example, more easily at, at right routine appointments than others. For example, there are punch biopsy, um, biopsies that happen with teams we work at at Harvard MGH regularly, and we are working those samples up in case there's signal in those tissue samples that are regularly connected at appointments from patients. Also, lymph node aspirate can sometimes be collected with a fairly routine procedure. So we're making sure that we analyze all these different types of sample to best understand what can be found where. And also, I think it's key is that in the research studies that we're doing, we're combining patients who have, for example, an intestinal tissue sample collected via colonoscopy with the analysis of blood in the same patient to figure out how much we can see and what correlates between what's found in the tissue and what we can pick up in blood. Because the goal is to have a, a, a blood test that it can identify antigen or, or that. So I think that's the most hopeful biomarker. I actually do think that there is um, a Paxlovid clinical trial that will be using, or there's one or two Paxlovid clinical trials that will be using that testing for spike protein in as one of the uh, outcome markers. And I think also Akiko could speak to some of what she's been measuring being used as outcome measures in, in clinical trials. So there are, that is moving forward. And so I think that there's, while more research is needed, there are some, some leads, especially there on what can be measured in blood from what Akiko is measuring and, and the spike in the antigen. All right, thank you. We'll turn it over to Lisa to take some of the audience questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, do, what do we know about the role mitochondrial dysfunction plays in long COVID? Dr. Proel, do you wanna take that one? Sure. You know, I wrote a paper with my close colleague, Mike Van Elziger, called Pathogens Hijack Host Cell Metabolism. And it's a paper that actually walks through the mechanisms by which viral and bacterial and fungal pathogens hijack the metabolism of the cells that they infect. And one thing to understand about viruses is they're obligate intracellular pathogens. So they require, they, when they replicate, they need to create another copy of their backbone and they must pull from substrates produced by the host cell mitochondria in order to proceed with that replication. And that undoubtedly will change the metabolism of the host cell in that infected cell. So there is complete correlation between viral activity, viral replication, and the metabolic profile of the cell. So it's a completely connected topic, and I think that it will be important to study changes in metabolism in concert with studies of the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself. In other words, not to approach the topics as two separate things and say, oh, this team's going to work on the virus and this team's going to work on metabolism. But the field of immunometabolism now is combining those topics. And if researchers in that field, that's, for example, our articles published in the journal Immunometabolism, these research teams, these areas that are combining those areas of research are going to be important to pull into the past field. Thank you. Dr. Iwasaki, this one is for you. Several epi studies are now pointing to an increased incidence of PASC in women. What do we know about mechanisms for the sex difference? Uh, that's a great question. We're actually uh, preparing a paper on that as we speak. Um, so the my long COVID study that I described to you today was not um, uh, sex disaggregated, but we are now doing a study on that same subject um, to, to see whether there is any sex differences in immunity as well as symptoms. And there's actually a very distinct uh, difference between male and female uh, past patients with respect to symptoms, their immune responses, um, and the, the link between the immune response to the symptoms. So that's coming up. Uh, one particular um, interesting uh, thing that we're seeing is that the EBV reactivation and the um, IL-6, IL-4 double positive CD4 T cell, that link is particularly dominant in women compared to male patients. So um, we, we will be learning a lot about that, but it's a great question. Thank you. 
Um, Dr. Stone, this one is for you. Are microthrombi in the lungs in acute infection the same as microclots detectable in long COVID? An interesting question. Part of the problem in the acute phase is that the thrombi that we detect, uh, particularly at autopsy, are heavily dependent on how the patient was treated. Um, so even within deaths uh, in the acute phase, thrombi can either be entirely fibrin thrombi or they can be platelet microthrombi, and it often determines how the patient was anticoagulated prior to death. Um, there really haven't been, to my knowledge, systematic studies trying to compare uh, microthrombi in long COVID with acute COVID. Part of, the, part of the issue is we don't tend to see as many microthrombi in the tissues of patients uh, in the post-acute phase. So that's, it's much harder to find those and to compare them. So I don't know if there's a systematic difference or not at this point. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Iwasaki, um, given the intriguing finding of reduced cortisol levels in long COVID, have HPA axis studies been conducted in these patients? And if so, what were the results? Uh, yeah, another excellent question. So as I mentioned, uh, cortisol is regulated in diurnal fashion during the day. And so we're now um, collaborating with David Petrino's lab to collect uh, diurnal levels of saliva cortisol uh, from a number of uh, his patient participants to see if we can see if there's any changes of their levels during the day. Uh, as I mentioned, we only collected one time point sample from these participants so far. So we want to know that during the day, if there's any difference in the pattern, and if so, if, if there's any uh, difference in the ACTH level and other um, hypothalamic controls. And for that, we may need to do more um, MRI studies and others, which are also ongoing with um, David Petrino's group. Great, and I think there's probably time for at least one last question. Uh, again, for Dr. Iwasaki, were you able to segment immuno, Im, immunofiling for, immunoprofiling for just brain fog sufferers? And was there any pattern of interleukin elevations, elevations of interest? Oh, yeah, that's a great question once again. So I, I mentioned the study that we published with Michelle Monge's group at Stanford. Uh, there, we saw elevated CCL11, which is known as eotoxin 1 as well, um, in circulation that correlated with the brain fog reporting by the, um, uh, the same Mount Sinai participants that were studying. And that tended to be um, elevated more in male than female. So that's interesting. That particular uh, chemokine is correlating with brain fog, but more dominantly in male. Uh, so there's a lot to study there. A lot more to look at. All right, I think with that, we're at time. So I think we should close, but thank you. What an elucidating and intriguing set of presentations. Thank you to all of our panelists and thanks to the audience for joining us today. And as Dr. Lackwitz Scroggins said, these presentations represented an overview of mechanistic pathways, and we will be deep diving on some of these pathways going forward. An FAQ document for this webinar will be posted along with the recording of the webinar on recovercovid.org. It will include answers to all of the questions that were asked today and those that were submitted in advance. Questions about other scientific topics will be addressed in future webinars and answers to broader questions about recover will be available in the FAQs at recovercovid.org. So I encourage you to attend future R3 webinars that will deep dive into some of these broader topics. And again, thank you to great presentations and great discussion and have a great afternoon and a good week.